applause for Maxime Chaya. Good evening, everyone, and thanks again. Wonderful music. Okay, my name is Maxime Chaya. I um, come from Lebanon. I flew in uh, just yesterday, and I'm delighted to be here. As you'll probably see, I'm a different type of speaker. I'm not CEO, not CFO, not COO. I actually learned the real meaning of the word startup this very morning on the bus from someone uh, from uh, Mexico. And I did find the parallel that both of us, what I do and startups do, uh, involves a lot of risk. Anyway, uh, I'm simply the corporate ambassador of Lebanon's largest bank, Bank Audi, who had the vision and the courage to back my uh, crazy out-of-the-box idea. Now, when I learned I'm going to be speaking at the end of the day, I thought I would uh, prepare an audio-visual presentation with more photos and videos so you won't fall asleep on me. Um, and I vowed to myself that I would not repeat the word innovation at all. Okay, you see, I grew up in my home country, uh, Lebanon, um, and because of the war, I was prevented from achieving my ambition to become a professional athlete. And so, when I discovered the high mountain, and learned about something called the Seven Summits, I challenged myself to attempt to climb the Seven Summits, simply to prove to myself that had I been given the chance, I could have achieved my ambition to become a professional athlete. <clears throat> so, in my presentation entitled, There's an Everest for Everyone, um, I will take you along with me to places I've been to, uh, from the comfort of your own seats, and I will show you photos and excerpts from videos that I filmed myself on the mountain uh, to illustrate some of the lessons I'd like to share with you today. In the videos, I sometimes speak in my own native language, but there are subtitles in English, of course. Let's start with uh, getting to know what the seven summits are. Maybe most of you know, but just to repeat, they're simply the highest peak on each continent. And here they are. We have Denali in North America, Aconcagua in South America, and then in the, in the extreme south of the planet, we have a continent called Antarctica. Its highest peak is called Vinson. Then there's Kilimanjaro in Africa, which was the first of my seven summits without me knowing there was anything called the seven summits. Of course, there's Elbrus in Europe. There's Everest, which is the highest peak in the world. And we have a little geographical dispute regarding the seventh summit. Some people think it should be uh, on the Australian mainland, and others think we should include Indonesia um, to this area. And just to make sure, I climbed both. So I began with Kili. Um, in my book, Steep Dreams, which is actually backstage, um, it's the first chapter, and it is entitled Metamorphosis. Um, it is where I discovered the high mountain, and while walking back from the summit, I understand that this is one of the so-called seven summits, and this is where you have a lot of time to yourself when you're walking down a mountain. I thought to myself, why not attempt to climb the seven summits, knowing that at the time there was only 54 or 56 people who were able to achieve it. I ended it with Everest on May 15, 2006, for me, it's like a new birth date, so I'm a little older than 11 years now. Um, you cannot be but 100% committed uh, to attempt Everest. You really have to be a very specific and very, um, you have to have expertise in this very, very narrow field to allow yourself to go and come back to your family, let alone making it to the summit. is a lethal mountain. Every climber taking the challenge stares death in the face. And every season adds to the body count.
Yes, every season adds to the body count, meaning that every year there's climbers who leave their lives on the mountain, and this is why I kept Everest for last. So I climbed all of the seven summits before attempting Everest. There are eight here because of that little geographical dispute I spoke about. Now, as preparation for the seven summits, I climbed other mountains. Um, I also skied to both the South and the North Pole, just the last degree. One degree is 60 nautical miles. That's about 110 kilometers, uh, just to get used to what we call cold weather techniques. So I can come back to you with all my fingers and toes, which is not what most, a lot of people who, who've been to Everest can say. And all of that was part of the Audi Seven Summits project. Like I said, Audi is uh, Lebanon's no largest bank, and they were the only ones who had the vision and the courage to back my um, crazy idea back then. You know, hindsight is 2020, but back then, someone from a country with virtually no mountaineering backgrounds to challenge himself to go and climb the highest peak in the world, simply to plant the Lebanese flag on the summit, was definitely out of the box. And uh, so now when people, you know, recognize me in the restaurant or on the street or whatever, and they thank me, in my heart, I turn around and thank um, this bank, and in particular its CEO who had the vision and the courage to, um, uh, to back me. Then we have this saying by this famous uh, philosopher of ours, Gibran. It says, and when you have reached the mountaintop, then you shall begin to climb. So I'd reached Everest, so does it stop there? I looked around because I still felt like I could do more, and I found another challenge called the Three Poles. We all know the South Pole, the North Pole. Can anyone guess what the third pole is? It's actually Everest. Everest is considered as a pole because it's like a pole on Earth and it encompasses a lot of ice. And I'm happy to say that I was able to achieve the last of my three poles, um, the, uh, the North Pole, on the 25th of April, 2009, um, when myself and my two teammates from USA and Canada reached the North Pole, 90 degrees uh, north, after 53 grueling days on the ice. Then, still unable to sit still, uh, I went ahead and rode across the Indian Ocean. We started off in Australia, and we finished off in, in Mauritius. And despite uh, great um, difficulties and life-threatening problems, my two teammates and I, one from the UK and one from Denmark, were able to uh, make it to the other side. And we actually broke two world records, including the world speed record. And in the words of the folks at uh, Guinness, officially amazing. Um, thank you. <laughs> okay, so that's very good and very well for Max, but what's in it for you? So let's see how you can row your ocean, how you can trek to your poles, how you can climb your seven summits, how you can climb what I call the mountains of the mind. So for you tonight, I've devised seven steps to seven summits. Could you do it? If you put your mind to it, there is nothing to stop anyone from climbing any mountain, especially the ones in the mind. What will it take? Training. Training your mind. Because it all starts in your head. Everest pushes elite climbers to the limit and shrugs off the rest. It's hard up there. We're sitting down here in the sun now, talking about it, but up there it's brutal. Some people would say that's the meaning of life, right? Pushing yourself to the ultimate limit to see what you're capable of um, and to, to come back from that experience and reflect upon it. No one's going to stop you from taking that step. No one's going to stop us from taking that step, so let's take it. Seven steps to seven summits. Step number one. Vision. Begin by having a vision, by setting a goal. Who and where do you want to be? Without a goal to aim towards, you're going nowhere slowly. You see, working without a goal is like taking a photo that no one's going to see, or writing a book that no one's going to read, or organizing an event that no one's going to attend. And um, a few years back, my vision was to stand atop Mount Everest. 
That's the only thing I could see. And to do that, I had to put aside good work for even better work, because we're always capable of better work. And I knew that I should never rest more than what is needed. Of course, it is essential to rest. But once we're rested and recovered, if we're still inactive, we're wasting valuable time to get to our summit. I also knew that there, would be gonna, there were going to be sacrifices. And for some reason, I was never afraid to move out of my comfort zone. Leaving your comfort zone stretches it, and it makes you appreciate the, the relative comfort of the comfort zone so much more. And it makes you less uncomfortable on the fringes. I definitely had to move out of my comfort zone many, many times, like going to the john when it's minus 40. Definitely not a pleasant feeling. Carrying your whole house on your back, including the kitchen sink. Uh, sleeping in what we used to call freezing bags, not sleeping bags, at the North Pole because it's so cold and wet. Crawling across um, a frozen lead. This is a technique we learned from polar bears. Even polar bears don't like to get wet, so when the ice is marginal, they distribute their weight on their tummy, their forearms, and their, their thighs so as not to go through. Going through the water is not so bad because the water is like minus two or minus three degrees, but it's when you come out of the water wet into a minus 30 and 40 um, environment that you start losing fingers and toes. And of course, when uh, the ice lead, uh, when the uh, lead is not bridged, when the ice is not thick enough, we swim across wearing um, uh, dry suits. Or even having to row your shift when your body parts are screaming for mercy. And all of these lead me to step number two. Passion. Passion demands enthusiasm and a fixation. It's what makes us get out of bed in the morning. Passion teaches you courage. It makes us audacious. With passion, even the toughest objectives can be achieved. But in my view, there's a fine line between passion and obsession. Don't let your passion move into obsession. It's going too far. If it's preventing you from going to bed at night, it's going too far. It may backfire, and it might even scar you for life, like it scarred me. This is me when I came out of the ICU of a hospital. I was back home skiing up a mountain, and there was a storm developing, and I kept going, and I was hit by lightning. Apparently, it came in through my forehead and out from my palm down into the ground through the pole. So you can actually say I'm living overtime now. Everest is the mountaineer's holy grail. Her allure is magnetic. There's just something very magical about this mountain. <clears throat> the biggest, baddest mountain in the world. More than 200 climbers have died on her slopes. So why do they keep coming? They're all bad. Alpha males, if you want to describe they're all driven to succeed. So this particular trip is probably my selfie scene I've ever done. For these guys, life needs to be more than a walk in the park. Why am I doing this? I need mean, the challenge of it. To see, I mean, can you do it? This is the last great human adventure. But it comes with a perilous price tag. You do not have the strength to go to the summit, I don't want you to die. Fear is an unexpected ally at the edge of existence. If I wasn't worrying, I shouldn't be here. It's good to have fear. Fear brings us back home to our family and our friends. We are leaving now. Faced with high altitude, extreme weather, lack of oxygen, and gut-wrenching hard work, no one can predict who will succeed. Definitely no one can predict who can succeed. But still, Everest draws to it. Okay, no excuses. And this is what we want to make. Problem. Can you hear me? Okay, I'll try and raise my voice so we don't waste time. An excuse is when we want to find a scapegoat for our mistakes. So, no excuses and definitely no blame. If we're involved in something that goes wrong, never blame others. So it's my fault that the sound system did not work. I take full responsibility. 
Besides, if we're a real team, what difference does it make who makes the mistake? Redefine. No task is unimportant in any business. So if we're going to do something, we might as well do it as best we can. Not only that, but from the first time. How many times have we had to repeat something simply because we didn't give it 100% effort the first time? This is my tent at Camp 2 on Everest. We got there, tired, suffering from the hypoxia. And to set up the tent, you know the tent has two tents really, the inner tent and the outer fly. And often we do not tie all of the tie cords on the outer fly. So I must have tied six or eight out of 12 and I went for sleep. And then the wind, wind picked up at night. And I spent the rest of the night on my knees praying that the tent wouldn't fly away, simply because I had forgotten, forgone that simple task of uh, securing down the tent. So no matter how lousy a task is, redefine it. Turn it into an opportunity, a chance to shine. Again, this is me here at ABC, Advanced Base Camp, where we check all of our equipment and apparatus before we go for the summit push. And I checked my breathing apparatus, and it, and it looked fine. Then I went and double-checked it in the, in the silence of my tent, and I found not one, but two leaks. And had I forgone that simple task of double-checking my breathing apparatus, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today. So, be thorough. Attend to the last detail. Don't think that small things don't have a big impact. And don't was walk past something that doesn't feel or look good. Have the courage to step in and do something about it. Connect with your heart for the good of yourself and the whole team. At the risk of sounding contradictory, I'm going to say make mistakes on one condition, learn from them. I think it was the CEO, the late CEO of Time Warner used to say, in this company you'll be fired if you don't make mistakes. So when mistakes are allowed, go ahead and make them. They're cheap lessons, so as not to make them again when they're no longer allowed. On the mountain, you never allowed the same mistake twice. This is the Karstens Pyramid, which if we put aside the Kosciuszko version of the seven summits is the lowest. But I can tell you that it is on this mountain that I felt my life threatened most. See, the last 700 meters is nothing but technical climbing, where you use ropes and, and technical climbing equipment. We got to the summit. It began snowing. Because we're in a warm part of the world, the snow melted on the ropes. And then all of a sudden, it got cold, and the ropes froze. You can climb a mountain like this without the use of ropes but you cannot effectively and safely descend without ropes. And coming back down, I really felt like my life was hanging uh, on, on my backhand, repelling down. In actual fact, this photo was taken by my good friend Christine Boskov, the owner of Mountain Madness that she had inherited from Dave Scott. Uh, Christine sadly died nine months later on an unclimbed peak in China. I hope she did not take that peak lightly. And remember, failure contributes to success, but only after 100% effort. And I stress on the 100%. The problem when you don't give 100% and you fail is that you will never know whether you could have succeeded. As preparation for Everest, I attempted to climb Gasher Broom. I failed. I actually returned before reaching the summit. I actually returned with a Spanish team who had lost a climber on the mountain, his name was Jose. So they were four on the way up, I had to join them to be four on the way down. And here's a little excerpt from the video I filmed then. Japanese <laughs> مثل ما شايفين من حذر كتير وفوقنا ما فينا نشوف ولا نسمع شو عم بصير يعني إذا نزل إنزلاء بكون خطر جدا علينا صار في إنزلاء علي الحمد لله مهمين كتير بس بدل بخاف الواحد إنه شيء كبير ينزل من فوق وإذا شيء كبير نزل من فوق ما حدا بضل طيب أفالانش رهيبة صارت قدامنا هلأ شوفوا قديش عريضة تحت 
نيات الامطار بركي اكثر من كيلومتر وبعده عم بينزل من فوق اختلج بتمنى التوفيق لكل زملائي هلا انا باكثر من نص الطريق بين المخيم الثاني والمخيم الثالث زملائي فوقي ما في حدا تحتي والطريق للمخيم الثاني ارجع انزل طويل كثير فعلا ما بعرف شو بدي اعمل هون حدا نوقع كفوفو ما في قوة يرجعوا يوقفوا So failure is not bad. I failed that mountain, but I believe that my failure on that mountain and what I learned from it contributed greatly to my success on Everest. Step number five is the plateau. This is the ever important pause on the way to the top where the mind and the body are integrating a new set of information and skills. You know, you work endlessly, you find a breakthrough, and then you finally get better at something, and then you stall on a plateau. It might take a week, a month, or a year, and it might feel dull at times, but it is essential for long-term success. Why? Because subconsciously we're learning. Underneath the, uh, the skin, the lessons are sinking in. Life is definitely never a smooth ride up a neat slope. Uh, it sure wasn't for the big world changes that we've heard about uh, and who've created um, um, startups. I think of Steve Jobs, how much he must have uh, suffered before he got to where he got. This is Everest ABC, a a um, Advanced Base Camp, 6,400 meters. We spend most of our time there, whereas the summit is way higher at 8,850 meters. What are we doing there? Drop someone straight on the summit of Everest, and they'd be dead in minutes. At such altitude, if you don't acclimatize first, your body self-destructs. If we were to find a magical helicopter to drop us on the summit of Everest, any one of us, we would only last minutes. Why? Because our bodies are not acclimatized. And it is the time that we spend on the mountain what doing what we call climb high, sleep low, which allows our bodies to acclimate and to, to, to go to the summit. So we need to be patient on that, uh, so on that plateau, on that summit, whatever the plateau, which is w where we are, be it 6,400 meters or even higher or lower. And remember, T, 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 things take time. People often ask me how long it took me to climb Everest, and I say, you know, from the time I left home to the time I came back home, it's about two months. And often I can see in their eyes, they're thinking of taking two months off work to go and climb Everest. It doesn't work that way. You really have to spend many years of planning and preparation uh, to acquire the necessary knowledge and experience. Step number six, inspire. What will be your legacy? What will you leave behind? True leaders inspire their team to take the first step. I was close to 35 years of age when I took a significant step in my life. I don't know how I had the courage to do it, but I've never looked back. When you exude optimism and self-confidence, you will inspire optimism and self-confidence in others. And this is true at all stages. We can all be great leaders of our own little bus. The last video I want to show you is one I filmed on a beautiful mountain called Amad Ablam. It's beautiful, but it's also very, very steep and very, very technical. Uh, so steep that Sir Edmund Hillary de uh, described it as an unclimbable mountain uh, when he went by it. لأنه استعملنا حبال ما كنا أكيدين منها وأي غلطة واحدة على هذا الجبل ما في بدل نزل واحد لكعبه يعني بدل نزل ألفين متر من دون ما شيء الحمد لله قدرنا وصلنا للأمة كلنا بألف خير آرون شوي عم بيسعوا البركة عم بيضيق من, من الارتفاع ونقلرها اليوم 
من الله راد اليوم آه ننزل صوب المخيم الثاني وبعدين المخيم الاول بعد في كثير خطوره بين المخيم الثالث والمخيم الثاني لازم نكون حذرين ان شاء الله خير فيني اخبركم شو الخطوره هلا هون بالنزله حبال وين ما كان ما بنعرف اي حبل منيحه اي حبل مش منيحه اي غلطه من هون مهوار من هون مهوار لازم نكون كثير حذرين The top is only half the journey When a climber sets out to climb a mountain what is the aim? To reach the top But once you're there you're only halfway Most accidents happen on the way back most climbers who lose their lives on the mountain lose it coming back from the summit. So we repeat this to ourselves time and again on the mountain, and I believe it can be applied to life in general. Life is a series of summits, and let's think of success as an ongoing journey, not a final destination. Finally, reinvent yourself. This is me uh, at the Royal Albert Hall in London, getting my honors London School of Economics degree in the company of uh, Queen Anne, who was handing out the, 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 the diplomas. Yet I chose to live uh, my life in the company of yaks in the great outdoors. So without forgetting the past, free yourself from it. It will eliminate the toughest barriers, the ones in our minds. Why can't it be done? If it, and if it can't be done, why can't I do it? I kept Repeating this to myself, there was only 54 uh, people who had achieved the seven summits. So I kept saying to myself, okay, they're not many, but if they've done it, why can't I? Obstacles, I knew there'd be obstacles, but obstacles were made for us to break through them and achieve our goals. Problems, of course there were going to be problems, but problems by definition have solutions. So let's take the existing ideas out of our mind to let innovative thoughts in. And uh, there's no shortage of innovative thoughts here. Let's reboot. You see, there comes a time when forgetting old ideas is mandatory, where, although it is tougher than accepting new ones. It's like before 1953, when uh, Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay made it to the summit of Everest, it was thought humanly impossible to get up there. But ever since they made it, there's climbers on the summit every year. The same with the four-minute mile before 1954, when Roger Bannister broke it. Now, every, every year, there's a new record. This will give us the courage to try something new for the first time. It may even help us uncover hidden talent. Ladies and gents, this is where it begins. Think of an Everest. And that be can be anything you can think of, indeed anything you can dream of. And picture yourself here on the summit. Thank you. <laughs>